Hello and welcome fellow audio enthusiasts. This is Two Channel Listening. I'm your host Jason and I pride myself on swimming against the stream in this audiophile world that we live in. What's this channel about briefly? Well, I for one am a bit of a lone wolf versus the other audio reviewers on YouTube. The first and key, main key point for you guys to remember is that I'm not out there scratching at all the manufacturers' doors begging for free handouts and free products to review. No, folks. I'm actually doing the research and I'm looking for products that I personally would want to own, want to try, and see just how good they are for any particular price point. So I do the research. I look for the lesser known brands, the boutique brands, those brands that are flying under the mainstream radar or just some hidden gems that happen to be out there. I negotiate those prices and I pay for those products out of my own pocket. I bring them back to review and in a live and die type of environment, this is a king of the hill type of review. Either the product makes it to the top and it stays or it gets cut from the list and it's going to be back onto the sales list. So that's how I roll. I review it and either it makes it and we have products that have been around for seven months already, if you can imagine that, or it's going to hit the cut list. That's how two channel listening works. Now, there's some huge exceptions for today. And those exceptions are that I went out of my way and broke the budget for today's review. The performance number one speakers by Eric S. Concept or the owner, Eric Smolski. Eric Smolski is from Warsaw, Poland. Eric Smolski has been designing audio equipment for over 20 years and decided to get into the business and create Eric S. Concept in 2004. Now, while Eric is a very small boutique builder, he's actually known to a lot of the European magazines and reviewers over there. The big one that I read is sixmoons.com, and Six Moons has covered several of his products, especially his top of the line Ketza speaker, which is a, a largest, large, large ish floor standing speaker with side firing woofers. It's quite, a, it's quite an interesting design and is very aesthetically pleasing as is pretty much everything that Eric puts his hands on. The Hi-Fi Pig has reviewed his product as well as our very own Enjoy the Music. They reviewed his gorgeous tube integrated amplifier, the Red King Amp. So Eric is not new to the audio world industry, but certainly as the first pair of speakers to hit the US, I'm the first to be bringing you Eric's speakers or Eric's product line. How did we meet? It's interesting. So Eric and I actually met over LinkedIn and I was doing a post on the Tectons in the zoos along with the IOs over here, the Alta IOs. And Eric reached out to me and wanted to work on some collaboration. So several, e several emails and getting to know one another, Eric and I, we share some philosophies when it comes to hi-fi and audio in general. And the biggest thing that I am in total agreement with Eric on is the fact that audio one should not be boring whatsoever no matter what the price point that you're spending your money on it should be interesting and not just the fact that okay a good audio circuit should sound good but why does it have to look boring or be a boring box Eric is definitely of the philosophy and this comes from his marketing background and his industrial design background where he goes out of his way to make a very aesthetically pleasing product that also would cater to our female viewers. Now, you know how I feel about that. So, you know, there's a lot of symbiosis going on here 
where we both wish to see a larger tent, a bigger field, a more inclusive environment for both women and men in the hi-fi channel realm. These speakers, I think, are no exception. So after weeks of communication and going through Eric's portfolio, what really caught my eye was these performance number ones. This, these speakers are his latest launch, which also happened to be his entry level stand mount speaker product. Now, this is a whole different level of entry level product, folks. For my budget oriented viewers out there, this is quite the departure for me in this channel in that I pulled out all the stops to buy a custom pair of speakers pretty much that are going to be my speakers. And we discussed bringing in or me importing these performance line, his entry level stand mount speaker. This color is a color that I picked out. I happen to be a car guy. And so this is Porsche British Racing Green uh, Metallic. It is automotive finish and it's actually a true um, automotive paint match color that he found and was able to reproduce for me. And as you saw in the 360 video, I think they're gorgeous. And of course I'm biased because I am such a fan of British Racing Green colors to begin with. So, you know, I truly feel that I am happy with a very unique product that as of right now, nobody else in the United States is going to have. So yes, for me, this was a pricey proposition and just the importation costs alone was a bit of a pricey proposition as well. However, it is also serendipity that I happen to still have the Alta IOS, the Alta Audio IOS. Poor Mr. Michael Levy, he must hate my guts because I just love to talk about the Alta IOS in not always the most flattering manner. Now, while you know I love the tweeter in them and I think that the mid to upper range is very beautiful with these speakers, I constantly pick on them for their price proposition value or in my own words, lack thereof. These speakers from Eric, they're not cheap folks. Remember, these are being imported from Poland. And as my wife of 22 years knows, the hi-fi world or the hi-fi hobby is cheaper than hookers, booze, gambling, and car collecting. So this is my vice. This is what I spend my money on. When the Alta IOs came out, as you see them in silver finish, this is what you could get. If you actually wanted a wood veneer, they were $3,500 in silver or over $4,000 with a wood veneer. Air speakers, since they're new to the United States for a limited time, their introductory price is $3,800, including shipping. But that also includes full paint custom matching. If you get the right, uh, if you get the paint code and send it to Eric, he will do everything he can if he can get that paint code to make that happen. That's some custom service for you. And while we're at it, let's talk about the cabinet, the speaker, and the components. You have a what I think is actually a large stand mount speaker, which speaks well to its base performance. This cabinet is 18 inches tall. This cabinet from the front baffle is 18 inches deep. What's nice is it's incredibly narrow. It is six and a half inches um, wide and it sports a six inch carbon fiber driver. Now the actual Base reflex design has different chambers on the inside of it and in my customary fashion I take the speaker apart or I take the drivers out and I get some nice pictures of the inside for you including that wonderful crossover that's in this speaker. So the front baffle is 40 millimeters thick or 1.5 inches for you Americans and 
my goodness, the son of a bitch is 30.5 pounds. This is not a light stand mount speaker, so you have to have really good uh, stands for this thing to sit on. A very other unique property to these speakers, Eric is a vintage lover and the type of mid tweeter driver that he, that he chose speaks well to that vintage love. So this is a three inch doped paper mid driver that also hand, handles the high end. Now it's a fairly uh, simple crossover. It's only five total components in the crossover and it crosses over at 2K. So you have a crossover with two air coils, two caps and one resistor. Speaking of the crossover, everything is Janzen and we're talking really nice Janzen copper, the copper air coils, as well as the Super Z caps. Mr. Io, on the other hand, other than the very nice uh, Foundtech ribbon tweeter, you have all Dayton components, including a seven inch Dayton driver. So just the one air coil that happens to be in Eric's speaker is a $28 air coil. All in all, this crossover in this speaker is just over $80 for you to buy it off the shelf and put it together yourself or well over $160 for both of the crossovers that's in these speakers. The Dayton woofer with the crossover does even come to $80 in this $3,500 Alta IO. Now again, does it sound good? Yes, it sounds good. And at the end, at towards the end of this video, I went through a bit of a process to actually start ranking all of the stand mount speakers that I have that I have owned and that you can see them all lined up and how they stack against themselves. So as I allude, so as I allude to the 360 intro for you guys in this video, this cabinet, the design elements the way it's finished and the way that its structure is, you guys can write in the comments, even with the importing fees, even with you know the custom components, I challenge my viewers to write in the comments, what speaker under $4,000 can even come close from an aesthetic appeal side to these performance number ones. I challenge everybody. I've, I've been looking and I like to find unique and I think I found something truly unique, which is you know what brought me to the point of saying, okay, I'm willing to spend that kind of money so that I have a, a one-off type of pair of speakers. At the end of the day, what is that, what does that big coin buy you as far as sound quality goes? I know that's what everybody is just itching since I've been teasing these things for nearly six weeks for you all. Now, I've hooked up no less than six integrated amplifiers in over three weeks with these speakers, going on four weeks. And as of last week's video, this is going to be totally ridiculous, but I think it proves a point I'm starting to make consistently for everybody. Sound quality starts with your room. Your room has to be treated, and then it comes down to the speakers. If you spend the money on really well-built speakers, that's where the majority of your sound quality is going to come from. Third piece on the, on the line and of lesser note is going to be the front end. And a lot of people are going to be upset with me at saying that, but this little son of a gun, prove that out in spades. At $245, 25 watts, I played Eric speakers for three days with this little guy and I have witnesses. The combination 
was mind-boggling. Yes, nobody in their right mind would buy nearly $4,000 speakers and then put a $245 integrated amplifier with those speakers, but it did work and it worked exceptionally well. Yes, it's not a sustainable thing. It doesn't make sense in the long run because the speakers deserve better and they can sound better with higher quality components. But at no given time was this, a, oh my God, I got to rip this out of the system. No, for three days, I sat in amazement and just, as I say in Jason talk, giggled myself silly at at what a good combination this was for the for the price. Now, yes, I have my audio, I have my Unison Research Unico P integrated amplifier. It's a hybrid two bit tube and a class AB amplifier, as well as I've been running in the Peachtree Nova 150, the middling child in the Peachtree lineup. Those two I spent the most time with. While I did probably give the name 5SI a, a solid five days of uh, hookup time with Eric speakers. And I, I say this again, the Unison, the Peachtree, and the name, while so close in price, they also varied very, very minutely based on their topology and their methodology of the sound reproduction that they specialize in. And this is where it gets to just become, it's fine tuning. You fine tune the sound of your loudspeakers based on all these different variables or these different integrateds. For me, that's why I like the integrateds because it makes it easier to fine tune what the speakers could sound like. Two channel listening fans, we had a bit of a wardrobe malfunction with the mics that uh, basically the entire section of, well, how does it sound, could not be used. The mic decided to flip inside of my shirt, and this is a flimsy shirt, so if you wanted 18 minutes of how did Darth Vader sound, that's what you were going to get. So I had to move to another room as it's much later in the afternoon and I'm reshooting the how does it sound segment. So performance number one, what, how does it perform? This is how I would summarize it. My favorite part from the very get go, what is the base? This six inch driver, this six inch carbon woofer driver, it's light on its feet, yet because of the cabinet volume, the large cabinet volume that Eric has designed into it with the bass reflex, produces an incredible amount of bass that absolutely reminds me of any decent floor standing speaker. And with that, Going through the bass test, and I run every speaker through sweep tests, sweep tones, and I even went out of my way to uh, use a tool to create a 30 to 50 sweeper, 30 hertz to 50 hertz sweeper that loops so that it allows me with each cycle, with each 20 second cycle, to crank up the volume a little bit more, a little bit more until I start to hear some overdrive of the driver. And uh, you know you know when you've hit, you start overdriving a, a woofer driver. At around 95 dB, which is way beyond what we would normally listen to when sitting in our, you know, sitting and kicking back with the folks listening to your favorite music, pushing these speakers to 95 dB from my listening spot eight feet away and technically with where the port is it would be at 18 inches it would be over nine feet away uh, i was only hearing the lightest of a huff a huff huff and very impressed with how little noise no matter how loud or should i say once i once it once it started to produce the huff 
No matter how much more volume I gave the speaker, the huffing did not get louder. The port, ni port noise did not increase with the dB and the volume, which that's that's something unique to the speakers I've been testing so far with the with the bass sweeper. So you know, really kudos to to Eric for the bass performance tuning with the the with this. While punishing the speaker, and, and believe me, I punished the speaker. Since this is a speaker I'm going to own, it's pers and I personally plan to be holding on to for quite some time, I push this speaker as if it were my own, like I stole it, and just proceeded to punish the living daylights out of the woofer to see what, you know, where the limitations of it would lay. And one, um, you know, obvious song to bring out would be Lord, her track Royals. Now with Royals, it just has a, a, a backbeat and a low thump that for any speaker that's worth a damn that has a good woofer is going to shake the room and it's going to have a good, it's going to have this nice good pulsating slam within the synth line. This six inch woofer was able to just absolutely pump that out and, and pull it off. So while you have while you have the the low rumbling through the room, there's also the kick drum punch that you would expect there to maybe be a little bit of smearing with the two lows together trying to overlap. One is definitely not as loud as the other, and the you know the kick drum doesn't doesn't hit as hard. I mean, it's still at the end of the day, it is a six inch driver but you hear it and you hear the layers and you hear the texture and the room will still give a, a very decent rumble and it energized the apartment more than I should have allowed it to. Nevertheless, uh, this is a speaker that will make it to my large front room in the new house here pretty soon. So it's important to me that in the larger room with way more cubic, cubic square feet that I find speakers that can, you know, are going to be able to, you know, give off that room energy as I move move my listening position back. This speaker can handle the bass and incredibly impressed with the low ends. You put on Hans, Hans Zimmer, you put on Time from the Inception soundtrack. Again, all the synth lines are there. It flushes them out. You have nice, clean tonality to it. And it's while it's warm, you're not losing any of the detail. And that's, that's just very impressive with such a small driver. Again, making, making up the volume because of the, air, the additional airspace of this large cabinet. Uh, another song that I've, I've reintroduced, Patrick O'Hearn, and it's Panning the Sands. That is a fantastic bass test uh, track, if you will, and I'll put the, a link to that in the, uh, the description page. The mid-range. Now, I have to marry the mid-range and the tweeter together just because of the, the unique design. Because the woofer crosses over lower at 2000K versus some of the other designs that are most of the designs I actually have cross over above 3K. And so with this mid, the mid tweeter taking on more action at a lower crossover point, I'm just going to, you know, speak to the mid and the highs together. And the mid range definitely uh, acquits itself as you would have to expect in a speaker at this price range. I mean, let's not kid ourselves. When you spend four thousand dollars, there's a huge expectation that this thing better perform as expected, and so you know, without a doubt, I absolutely re-fell in love with a particular few live albums. Sarah Bareilles, her live in Atlanta. You put on Yellow Brick Road, and oh my God, with the Peach Tree, with the Peach Tree Nova One Hundred and Fifty plugged into plugged into the speaker. The sound stage was several feet outside of the walls of each speaker, and I had to, well, I didn't have to, but I really, it's like I got up out of my listening chair and I wanted to go touch the back curtain 
of my listening space just because it, it really, it did what I would want it to do finally. Even with a class D amplifier that tend to push things forward, with Eric's speakers, the soundstage was pushed back and Sarah just, it was, it was, it was right sized. It's, it's very hard for a soundstage to, to be replicated in your room to where the singer sounds the size that they should, not exaggerated, not overly large, not like they're 10 feet over the top of you, or what I really don't like in a lot of speakers with class D amplifications is, or even really hot AB amps, is they can tend to feel like they're in your lap, and that's just, that's too forward, that's not fun for me. There was a great combination with the peach tree and and this speaker with the live albums and i can't mention i can't not mention sarah Borelis with Borelis with uh, melody gardot her live in europe you put on the bonus track wayfaring soldier i'm sorry wayfaring stranger and again there was something just warm and right to the female vocals that you get with, you know, you're just going to get with those paper mid-range uh, in tweeter designs. I did have to readjust my focus and readjust my thinking coming off of several speakers in a row that had the ribbon tweeter with this Sierra Acoustics, the Sierra 2, the 2EX, the Alta IOs. I, I admit that I was 100% uh, spoiled by the speed and the, the leading edge decay that, uh, that comes with a ribbon tweeter. There's just this, this airiness and their speed with any particular ribbon tweeter. It's a natural byproduct for that, that, uh, that type of a design. And going from a ribbon tweeter with its incredible extension back to a paper tweeter, you have to reset your mind and go, okay, the, there's there's a coloration, there's a warmth that's going a paper a paper tweeter is going to bring to your soundstage. It's going to bring to your presentation, and so you know one caveat that for some who love ribbon tweeters are probably not going to like the paper tweeter for this particular speaker, or in general is because the when you get to um, heavy drum kits. And this is where Patricia Barber comes in with her, her song Nardis. Again, it, it's a, it's a must-go-to test track because it has a very long drum solo in there where there's just incredible attack. And you start, you know, the, the drummer's getting on the crash cymbals, getting on the ride cymbal. A ribbon tweeter is going to exaggerate the ringing, the metal ringing within, within the, those two um, kits. And you're going to hear this, this extended time domain and it's going to be, you know, I don't want to say bright. It just, it, it extends out to the air and you hear more of the ring for longer. So it just has this longer time decay with a ribbon tweeter. You're not going to get that with a, with a, a paper tweeter. It's going to sound really warm. You're going to hear the hits. You're going to hear the sound but it's not going to be as delineated. It's not going to, you're not going to have that ring, that halo effect around a crash symbol or around a ride symbol. And so, you know, I just want to, I just want to throw that caveat out there. It was a little bit difficult for me making such a big change from the two different types of tweeters. At the end of the day, if you throw in my Unison Research, the hybrid amp, that's a hybrid AB with the, the tube preamp, now you're talking about you're talking about a synergy of musicality. And the musicality piece comes in where you're not you're not focused on, on hyper details. By having a nice, good, strong class AB amplifier with, with a tube preamp section to it, you are working to the strengths of what the speakers are already going to do. You are going to get this just you madly fall in love with the mid range and you're going to want to bring out every live album that you have just to sit there and listen to it in its entirety 
And I was doing a lot of that over the three weeks with this with this speaker where instead of just wanting to fast forward going through certain tracks where I know I have to listen for this specific instrument or this double bass or this cello or this violin, I'd let the songs play and I'd just let, let the track after track continue to play. And uh, I love the live albums with with the performance number one speaker. It just... It's a it's a calming effect, and it really it really at the end of the day it, it brings you back to, you know, for a reviewer specifically that's constantly changing gear, of why you do this, of why I do this, and what I love about the music and the differences in the fine tuning of the taste. So it was kind of interesting how Eric did the crossover to push, you know, the extension of the the paper tweeter all the way up to its max, which, you know, I, I freely admit I can't go past 16K. And uh, so, you know, having said that, you know, we need to be realistic when it comes to the expectations of high-end drivers and high-end tweeters. While I, I gush so much about ribbon tweeters in, in you know, that leading edge detail that they can give and the air and the extension, there's also something to be said about having a warmer, non-fatiguing presentations that allow you to, to, to focus even more on, on female and male voicing at those lower frequencies. So, you know, there, there's trade-offs. Even no matter what the price point, you have to spend, you know, so many thousands of dollars to, you know, get the most out of every single driver. And that's how people find themselves paying the kind of money that they do to get a Wilson or a Magico or whatever the case is. At these prices, you still have to have specific compromises and the compromise I would say with this speaker is that you're not, you know, it's not outfitted with the ribbon tweeter, so you're not going to get that total time, you know, time decay with, uh, with, you know, brass or metal type instruments. And so with all of the speakers that I have on hand, you know, at the end of the day, these beat the Sierras. At the end of the day, these beat the, the audio IOs does not still beat the tech I'm sorry the zoo dirty weekends because of the size of the drivers and what the zoos do there's just something special about large drivers and you know I want it you know I want you guys to first and foremost feel like I'm giving it to you straight that I'm not hiding something or even because I may be a brand ambassador for for Eric that I'm going to somehow gloss over something. Big speakers, big drivers produce big results. I like big results. When you have a Tecton or a Zoo with all of its 10, 10 inch drivers, it allows that efficiency to come through and naturally even at lower volumes and lower dBs, everything sounds bigger exaggerated to an extent and whether you like that or you don't but for me if I'm to rate what I have on hand at the end of the day the zoos are the fun factor they're the ones that play the loudest play the biggest and then when it comes to refinement and live albums I'm going to plug these speakers in bar none in you know the bass wise while the zoo plays bigger I was pretty surprised how close these came to the, the base of the zoos. Everything else that I've had that was a stand mount doesn't even come close to touching Eric's speakers. It's just, again, that was, I can't say enough how much that was a favorite part for me playing these back. I just was blown away how much bass, no matter if it was the drum kit, no matter if it was synthesizers, organs, whatever the case, it acquitted itself very well. One one other thing of note in the setup with with these speakers because of the depth of the cabinets and I'm in a smaller room and I'm only eight feet away from the tweeters to my listening position. These did limit me a bit in how far I could push them back to the back wall. 
I could get no more than 12 inches off of the back to where these would be a little bit too far forward. But I also noticed that if I have them closer than 12 inches to the back wall, the, the room battery and the base reinforcement would definitely over energize the room. That's how much base these things could produce. Three inches made a huge difference in how much more base would come out of the back of these speakers. So they were definitely a little bit uh, back wall placement picky, but if you're a base head and you want more, the further you push these back, you are gonna get an incredible amount of base energy off of these speakers. And then the other thing that I did was that in playing with the toe in, at the end of the day to really get that sound stage I was talking about, that really large outside of the wall sound stage, they actually played best 100% on axis. At times I would get them out to about 5%. Once I got them to 10%, it actually would close in the sound stage a little bit. So it was best to have them on axis for me in my listening position in more of an intimate setting. Now, as I've mentioned before, I'm only seven weeks away from my house being done. I'm gonna have a 20 three foot front room, huge room, and I'll be able to play again with that and I'll report back to you guys how that changes the dynamics of these with the bass response and being able to bring them further out into the room and if the soundstage can get even bigger. But until then, in my room, my apartment, you know, maximizing these on axis, minimum 12 inches off of the back wall to really reinforce that, that about that 35 hertz range in the bass. As promised to you viewers, when I threw up a picture of my sample scorecard about two weeks ago, letting you guys know, hey, are you interested in this? I am now gonna be posting this scorecard at the towards the end of every single review that happens to be with stand mount speakers. I hope you find this of value, and I also hope that you can see that no matter how hard I am on a particular speaker, I'm still, as truthful as I can be about the overall you know, specifications, what does it do, how does it meet the needs of, of me as, as a two-channel listener, my musical tastes, and does it, you know, does it suit me as something that I can live with on a regular basis? So, you know, you guys can send me questions on anything that you see there, or you wanna call out anything you think doesn't sound right or look right as far as those, those scores go. Uh, you know, I'm an open book for you guys. Many of you have been sending me emails and I respond to most of you within pretty much 24 hours. I, you know, I want to be accessible. I don't want to be one of those YouTubers that doesn't allow anybody to spend, you know, to put comments in there after a video or let alone respond to them unless you're paying for a Patreon page. Um, you know, and apparently I guess house plants or something else we're supposed to be reviewing. Um, I'm behind the times there. Anyway, um, let me know your thoughts in the comment section, folks. What do you think of these speakers? Don't be making fun of my paint. That's my paint. I picked it. I'm a car guy. Nevertheless, if you are interested in these speakers, you want to learn more or know how you can even order them, they are on my web page, which I will put in the, in the description I will link in the description page for everybody. And uh, yeah, you know, these are my speakers, so they're not going anywhere. You're gonna see them along with the Zoo and the Sierra 2EX for quite some time as anything else that I would bring in to review will go up against these. So for the meantime, I think Eric said he would extend the, uh, the intro pricing at 3,800 for the next three to four months. And uh, yeah, you know, I like having something super unique that nobody else has. So take that one, Mr. Mainstream YouTubers. Beat you to that punch. Everybody <laughs> have a wonderful week. And next week I will do the full blown review on the Peachtree Nova 150, the the unloved special middle child. I'm going to give it a nice big hug for everybody. 
Thank you and talk to you later. That's all, folks. Does that work?